Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, church, and welcome once again to the service. For those that will watch this part online, we want to welcome you once again, and uh, we just thankful that you're here with us to hear the Word of God preached once again in these walls. Do you want to uh, just remind those that haven't been with us, or just let you know that those that haven't been with us, we are in a sermon series, and it's going to go on for a while, so you're welcome to jump in and and uh, go back and watch the last few episodes, if you will, and, and, and catch up with us, or even just jump in now. You don't even need to catch up with us because we have a long journey to go still, and you'll be good to go uh, with us. But what we've been doing is we're doing the Gospel of Mark, and we're going a chapter at a time. And so my challenge to you is that this week you would go out and read chapter 4, and uh, just let it be just what you read this week. Let it just, even if you read it once a day, or even just once a week, or just a couple times a week, or find a verse that just speaks to you, let it become your mantra for the week. To just get in the scripture once again, and, and a chapter is really not that long, especially in the Gospel of Mark, but you can do it. Everyone has the ability to do that this week. Let's go to the Lord this uh, new year and really jump back into scripture, especially the story of Jesus and his teachings for us that are so pivotal here today. And so each week we're going to be coming at our sermon time and sort of just recapping what happens in that chapter, but specifically focus on a piece of that chapter for our sermon of that week. And so... Hopefully you've had some thoughts of yourself with our scriptures as we go apart, uh, go in. And my hope is that this week we're going to be starting up something. Probably will be on Facebook for an opportunity to have some interaction throughout the week uh, with uh, you and us. And uh, to have that ability to have the, the, the moments of when we come to scripture, just things that we want to share. Moments that maybe encountered in our life that we're living it out. Or maybe moments that challenge us where we fell short that we just want encouragement to share and to be challenged once again by a community of God together to live more faithfully for Jesus Christ. And all that uh, will be coming uh, hopefully this week. I do want to just mention to you once again that in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3 is where we're at. So first let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. The Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as we jump into Mark here today, our, our scripture comes from right at the beginning. So I'm not going to jump into that. We just heard it, but it does involve Jesus bringing a healing on the Sabbath, which we'll get into in much more detail here in just a moment. But what also happens in this chapter is the, the portion of this chapter where Jesus is taking on the Pharisees takes a brief pause. It kind of was going on in chapter 2. takes a brief pause for us to hear about the crowds that followed Jesus. And we're reminded once again that he was not only with crowds, not only doing miraculous works among them, but that he was driving out evil spirits, which is so critical to the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus is encountering forces beyond our understanding. And it is interesting, in case you were wondering, you know, we, a lot of times we kind of diminish the, the intellect, I would say, or the, the, the smarts of those who came before us. And we oftentimes think of the ancients as some people that just... Maybe they just attributed demon possession and all these things to all these other stuff we know today as common, uh, you know, not common, but maybe even common or rare uh, psychological disorders or things that happen in our body that make things go weird. And there's an argument to be made there, but at the same time, it is interesting that so many of these stories of healings don't involve demon possession, right? In fact, today's story doesn't involve demon possession really on the front of it in any way, shape, or form. And so it is telling that when, again, when the gospel writers write about this, it, 
one of the things we have to challenge ourselves is to not diminish the intellect of those first century people, that they understood a difference between you know, people having different psychological things and different ailments of the body than they did with true demon possession and things like that. So we always are challenged by that today because, of course, we don't speak in those terms, but it is worthy, once again, of Mark challenging us of that understanding that we'd have today. And then, of course, Jesus goes on and he, he appoints the 12 apostles. What's really kind of neat here is uh, Matthew, who's been called before, lived by Levi, in just a few chapters ago, uh, when Jesus calls Levi the tax collector. When it's mentioned here, he doesn't call him Levi, he calls him Matthew. And so this is actually the same guy, but it's interesting to point that out uh, in this moment. And we're given 12 names of people. And we can go into much more discussion about that, but 12 people... And hear this, we're called not only to go out and preach and drive out demons and all this stuff, but it first says that he designated them apostles that they might be with him. Now before you get to all the other stuff, don't miss over that little portion right there. They might be with him. And in fact, if you are a disciple, if part of what your duty throughout the week is to do and what you're supposed to live your life daily and every moment is to be with Christ. So again, if you haven't jumped into maybe a challenge of jumping into Scripture this week, if maybe that's something that God's just pinging your heart a little bit to be closer to Him and you haven't really spent time in prayer or the Scripture, join with us. It's not too late. Join with us. Read a chapter a week and delve into what God has for you. Then there's a story about Jesus coming together with the Pharisees and by this point, the Pharisees are really not like Jesus, and, and they start accusing him of, him of things. And in fact, they accuse him of basically being a demon himself, that he is using demonic powers to drive out demonic beings. And Jesus has some things to say there, which we'll kind of come back to uh, actually in a little bit. We're going to jump to that section at the end of today's service, so we won't say too much. But they were saying he has an evil spirit in him. And Jesus has some very sharp words for that statement. And then finally, there's a story of Jesus. He's teaching, and he's, so many people are there and all these things, and his family comes to call on him. And Jesus gets the message, and he sends back the reply, well, who are my mother and brother and sisters? And he looks around and he says to the crowd, those who do the will of God are my mother and my brother and my sister. And of course, when you hear that, it sounds kind of cheeky of Jesus, right? In the sense of like, well, that guy follows Jesus' brother and mom. I feel kind of kind of guilty. But Mark is very specific in the chat and a little bit few of the verses before. We oftentimes think they were just coming to see him and saying hello. Actually, but actually in Mark chapter 3 it says this in verse 21. Well, I'm going to start in 20. Jesus entered a house. Again, the crowd gathered and they were to the point where this Jesus and his disciples couldn't even eat. It was just a crowded house. They couldn't even daily functions like eat because Jesus was filled or was filled, his life was filled with so many people and it says this in 21 you never heard it before it says when his family heard about it they went to take charge of him so there was, people were saying I don't know if it means they or the family was saying this or the people themselves he is out of his mind and so you can see that too depending on they because it's hard to know in the original language which one the they is but it's either Jesus his mother and his brothers are thinking, Jesus is out of his mind. Let's go take charge of him. Or they're hearing the other people say that and they're being pressured and guilted into going to take charge of Jesus. So when Jesus sits there and denies the, the meeting with his family, there's a little bit more going on there than just his family shows up and he goes, eh, I don't want to talk to you. Right? There's, there's more going on there. They were there to take charge of him and Jesus doesn't go for it. In fact, he keeps doing the will of God in those moments. And so there's that that goes on there. So this is chapter 3, but I want to mention to you also that it's important to know when you read the Bible that chapters and verses, you need to take them with a grain of salt. And what I mean by that is they are not in the original language of the Gospels. They're not in the original writings that it, of the Gospels or any part of the New Testament for that matter. None of it was written with chapters or verses or even the subheadings. In fact, there's, we get into much more deeper, but basically subheadings not the ones we have, but other subheadings that were given by the Byzantine Empire go all the way back to about the 5th century. But it was about the 13th century that you saw chapters develop. And then the chapters as we know them get developed even a little bit later, slightly later than that. And then in the 16th century, the actual verses that we know today were given. 
sort of came kind of standard. And so it's much, much later that these things are brought into the Bible. These are sort of para-Bible things that are brought here. They're useful, of course, when we mention Scripture to look it up. You know, you can look up Mark chapter 3, verse 5 very easily uh, to know that than just to have it all memorized. However, the original language, original books didn't have that. The original audiences and hearers of the Scriptures didn't have that. And so some of the breaks you have in Scripture, like for instance, this week going from chapter 2 to chapter 3, some of that story really is continuing in the little portion of it before. What I mean by that is in our scripture here today comes from chapter 3, verses 1 through really 6, but 5 especially. And this is a story of continuing on with this idea of Jesus versus the Pharisees, and specifically Jesus not adhering to what the Pharisees thought he should do. And basically they forgot that what they thought he should do was what God, they had sort of forgotten that. They assumed God had told Jesus and others to live this way. But really, it was just their laws to understand, and not to go too far to where God had said not to go. And so when you read the scripture here, this section that we have today really kind of goes with the portion before, and, and the kind of the ideas of the themes and what's going on there. And what I mean by that is it starts off with the calling of Levi, this portion. And you remember what happens when Jesus calls Matthew or Levi, when he calls him, he goes and eats at his house. And he's with a bunch of sinners, right? And to be clean in those days, especially a teacher of the law or someone to be respected, you were supposed to follow God's law. And the reason why people were called unclean is because they did things that were slightly out of the bounds of the ritual laws, of the dietary laws, of the, the washing laws, the cleansing laws. And so when Jesus rubs elbows with those, he's really risking his cleanliness himself. And so that starts off as an affront to the Pharisees. And really, anybody who was at this time, if you're reading this scripture, uh, if you came with the mind of the Jews at the time, you'd be going, whoa, I don't know about that. Like, that does not sound what I want my teacher doing, right? This is, this is not what you necessarily want. It, it, I would liken it to, like, imagine a, a pastor was doing a, a bar ministry, right, at a very, like, kind of, Bad saloon. Not just like, you know, you won't go down to like the beer place down here, you know, I'm talking about the big beer brewery. Not like that. I'm talking like the saloon that people go to get drunk at kind of thing, right? And your pastor is going down there, and he's not drinking a thing, or she's not drinking a thing, but, you know, it just has that feel of it, right? That it just feels odd, even though they're going with perfectly good intentions, that it feels weird. It's the same thing for Jesus in the day. And so it starts off with that, which is pretty risky. Then it goes on to about fasting, and Jesus gets questioned about his disciples and him, why don't you fast? And Jesus gives an answer. And so maybe a little bit less, you know, eating with these people seems very risky. Not fasting seems really awkward, but it's not quite as different because Jesus' answer makes a little sense. And so not quite as risky, if you will. And then he gets questioned about eating on the Sabbath where his, he wasn't eating, but his disciples were picking some grain to eat, about doing work in that sense of needing to eat. So they picked grains as they walked through the field one time. Jesus gives an answer there, and so you kind of see another layer of Jesus not acting according to it. And then today, something so obvious, so obviously good, something that no one, if they're really good and honest with themselves, if they sat there and saw what was going to go on, would question the goodness of the moment. The Pharisees are shown to be, their hearts are so stubborn and so hard. They can't even recognize the goodness and the miracles going on in front of them. And what I mean by that is our story here today, where Jesus goes to the synagogue, and in there was a man, it says, with a shriveled hand. And it says the Pharisees stopped and waited, because they knew Jesus was doing healings, they knew he was doing all these things, they knew he might just be compassionate in this moment, and so they know it's a Sabbath, and they watch him, ready to accuse him. How dare, on the Sabbath day, you bring healing to a person. That would be work. And of course, the scripture never anywhere directly says that healing somebody is work. But the way that the Jews had come to understand and the laws that they wrote, again, to protect themselves from ever coming close to, to messing up with God, they had written in the idea that to do healing on the Sabbath was work. Just think about that for a minute, how crazy that sounds. That the God who created Sabbath for a people who were oppressed, who were a people who were slaves and didn't ever have a rest, that he created a day to say, you know what, rest from your work. That by the time of Jesus, it had been encoded 
If someone is sick or hurting, don't help them. Instead, be pious on the Sabbath. Be perfect on the Sabbath and don't work. So Jesus has the man stand up in front of everyone. Again, this is the synagogue, not just the streets. You can imagine in the temple, like not temple, but the synagogue, a place of worship where the Jews were. He had him stand up in front of everyone. And he asked everyone there this question. Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? It says they remain silent. Oftentimes we don't hear Jesus' emotions, but we're going to hear it here. Mark attributes it. There's no doubt what is going on in Jesus' mind. Hear these words and let it just sink in. The heart of God in this moment. Again, the Pharisees are doing their best to honor God. They want to do every little thing, but somewhere along the way they got it so twisted up. In fact, their, their attempts to honor God have now got to the point where they're dishonoring God and they can't even see the goodness in front of them. In fact, they're ready to accuse because of the goodness that's about to happen. And Jesus asked him that question. He then looks around. And hear these words. It says, he looked at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and the hand was healed on the Sabbath. And at that moment, not only was the man he restored, but the Pharisees as went out, and they began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Just think about those interactions there. The people who were so diehard trying to follow God not only totally miss God, not only got to the point where they can't even see goodness in front of them, they go out and they plot evil because of it. In fact, later on they accuse Jesus in the same chapter, as I mentioned, of being someone who's a demon-possessed person or at least a demon himself, that he has an evil spirit in him or about him or for him. And that it's only by the powers of evil that Jesus is doing these good things. So it's not really good. Jesus lays out this statement to them. He says, I tell you the truth, that all sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven to them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. That's one of the scripture verses you hear, and it just makes you shudder, because you're like, wait, there's a sin that I can't be forgiven of. But... I want you to know that when I was in seminary, I, I can't remember all the details. I didn't have a really true chance to truly get into it and delve into it again this week to remind myself how I got there. But I remember the end result of my learnings from this was a lot in the language gets lost. And what I mean by that is the context and the language may be better suited to translate this verse like this. Is that while you're blaspheming, when you've seen something so just blatantly good in front of you and you call it evil, in that moment, there's no way to be forgiven. When you continue in that sin, when you continue in that blaspheme, when you call good evil, there's no way to be cleansed of your sin. So no matter what, these Pharisees have been drawn out and battles with Jesus and the evil spirits with Jesus. There's that soul reflection that all of us need to have. And that is that question. Do our hearts ever become so stubborn? Do our hearts ever become so wrong? Even when we're trying to do good, we try to honor God that we do evil instead. Amazing how Jesus casts out demons. He can cast out you and I as well in the sense of the evil that's within our life. And he's about the kingdom. And the short answer is this. If his mother and brothers come to tell him to do something different, Jesus isn't going to listen to them either. Just like you and I, even though we are servants and we seek to be servants of God, so many times maybe we put on Jesus things we shouldn't. But Jesus calls us to do good. Obvious good. And if we call that evil, shame on us. When I was younger, I remember there was a question, and this does question as I got older doesn't matter as much, just because you know life is a lot, a lot of interruptions, especially in COVID. There's a lot less interruptions in the sense. But uh, when I was younger, I remember when I first came to faith, it was that question of there was, there was always a challenge. Hey, go have your solitary time with God. Go, 
go have your moment with God, you know, read your scripture, do your prayer every day, and set it aside. And make sure that you keep that, you know, sacred to you, and don't let anything interrupt it. And so there was always a challenge, of course, when you're in high school or in college, because interruptions are just life, right? And so no matter where you go, no matter what solitary place you go find, when you go to, I went to University of Georgia, so 30,000 people on the same campus as you, you're bound to be interrupted, right? No matter where you go, no matter where you think you're in solitude, no matter what quiet place you find, especially when you're living in the dorms, there's nowhere you can go. You're going to be interrupted. And I remember so many often times there was that moment where I'd go off to just be with God and, uh, you know, there'd be someone that would just see the Bible or see me praying or whatever would come and want to have a conversation. And I remember it was always a challenge for me to know, like, okay, this is sacred time, right? This is God's time. Like, do I let this interruption happen? Or do I just say, hey, not right now, I need, you know, can I talk to you in a few minutes or something like that? And in those moments, I remember always being challenged. In fact, I remember asking different leaders in my life, you know, people of faith and that were adults and more wise than I, you know, with their take on it. And honestly, I was giving bad advice. They pretty much said, hey, in that moment, tell them to come back because you're with God. As I read more scripture, as I grow up and develop, I understand in that moment were opportunities to be good. In fact, those moments where I didn't listen to them and just said, hey, you know what, I'm going to talk to this person because they're going through a hard time or whatever it is they want to talk to me about. Those times were so richly blessed. And I missed out on some of those moments because I was too busy following the law, if you will, than I was about the Spirit of God in the moment of doing good. You know, all of us have that temptation that we could, even in our best attempts, miss what God has for us. And in those moments when we recognize them, we ask for forgiveness. God forgives us. We pick ourselves up. We walk with Him once again. Let us pray. Lord, as we hear today, we thank You so much for Your Scripture. And we're so moved by the fact, Lord, that You had called Your disciples that this world... Its forces of evil and even its people were against you so many times. And Lord, we take seriously that threat that each of us could always become that person. We'd see your work and see such obvious good, but call it evil. Even convince ourselves that it was wrong. When it's standing there plain as day as a good thing in front of us. So Lord, let us never hinder your spirit or your kingdom and your work this world, let us always instead be wrapped up in the goodness, take joy in what you're doing, and reflect your glory with our words and our deeds. I pray all this in Jesus' name.